So what are we really talking about when we um, talk about the convergence of physical and digital? We like to think that we're granting superpowers to the machines that serve us and the humans that use them. Intelligence is spreading now not only from humans to humans, but from humans to machines, machines to machines, and back to humans. GE has been a hardware-first company for something like 130 years. We know hardware. We've had this rich history of pushing the limits of physics in material science in, in immense ways. I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. The ceramic matrix material, um, compo their composites that insulate the inside of a jet engine, they can withstand temperatures that are as hot as inside of a volcano. Our MRI machines have components that are cooled to near absolute zero. Our nickel-based super alloys can withstand 10,000 atmospheres of pressure at 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd say those are some superpowers. If you want durability, we even have hardware that is barreling through intergalactic space aboard the Voyager 1 probe. So now imagine what we'll do when we take those kind of brilliant pieces of hardware and overlay software, data analytics, to make these machines more predictive, more productive, more brilliant. We're at work on this right now down in San Ramon in our software center. Let me give you an idea of some of the things we're looking to do and that we are doing. A jet engine has hundreds of sensors already on it. If you take just 20 of those sensors, they, could, they, they create about 5,000 data points or one terabyte of data in an average flight. We have deep water sensors that can identify 100,000 sounds in a 16 thousand foot radius and they know what uh, deep underwater and they know whether um, the sound is, is leaking they know what what's happening long before anything is visible so GE was this physical first company and we're becoming digital you heard earlier from Astro Teller about Google as a digital first company that's becoming more physical through uh, Google X um, this kind of convergence has been a long time in the making. Looking back, the light bulb in its day was an incredible breakthrough of, um, of technology. It was incredibly disruptive for its time. In fact, GE's earliest ad for the light bulb captured this revolutionary technology. Um, and this is how we heralded it. We said, here's a product that rivals the sun. You didn't really need to say anything more. So we had this wonderful hardware. It was a physical uh, manifestation, a revolution powered by photons and electrons. It enabled previously unthinkable um, boosts in human productivity. Um, the hardware itself was very powerful, but it, ma it lacked a lot of intelligence. In fact, it lacked any intelligence. And for all its good, the internet revolution has been, it's been very important, but um, it's given us intelligence that's disembodied from the physical. So it's digital without the physical. And so this idea of software merging with hardware is creating what we think is an amazing revolution in productivity. Um, it's creating all kinds of opportunities, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight some of them here for you today. We think by working together, we're able to bridge the physical and the digital, as well as the industrial and the internet. And we think by doing that, all of us are on the verge of changing the world in new ways. And that's what brings us all here today. We're excited. There's a lot of anticipation. There's a lot of confusion. Um, this new mashed up operating system is just coming uh, to, to light, but we think it's fundamentally going to change how we work, how we live, uh, this, this marriage of the physical and computational to push the limits of what's possible is absolutely astounding, but so too are the behaviors and what we value. I'm a marketer. I spend a lot of time excited about what technology can do to change our behaviors, what it does to drive new value. And I want to highlight four potential themes of the world we see arriving. So what we see uh, coming, coming forth is four new behaviors in this, what we're calling the brilliant age. It's creating new customer dynamics, new outcomes, new things to value. So the first thing I want to highlight for you is just, you're going to have to learn how to speak machine. 
Uh, industrial machines speak in kind of a babble of, uh, of languages right now. They're intelligible only to people who have highly specialized training or who have been working in years around these machines. But we're getting much better at following these conversations. I'd like to think we're on the verge of finding the Rosetta Stone. We're quickly becoming fluent in machine. We know that machines have this incredibly rich inner life. They, um, they're forcing us to become what we're calling machine whisperers. Um, we have to usher in the internet of things. When, when 50 billion things come online, streaming information at a near continual rate um, in limitless applications, it's going to mean that we're all going to have to understand what's happening in totally new ways. So one of the things that, that we're investing in that we think is critical, I know there are a lot of folks here in design and user experience, but we think experience design is really critical to be able to speak the language of, of machines. It's about creating interfaces that are rich in information, that are beautiful, that are easy to understand, um, that help us think at the speed of thought, that the machines speak at the th speed of thought. So we're not really talking about how, but we're not that far off from, from Siri. Let me give you an example of uh, a, a sort of early example of how this is coming to life. So maybe, I don't know if a lot of people here in the room know about um, maritime dynamic positioning, but it's an example of this kind of communication at work. In drilling vessels, um, they have to navigate their way through very complicated um, systems in, in, um, in marine and, and uh, water settings around the world. Marine dynamic positioning uh, tells the operators how to adjust their position, where they're heading, they have to know their altitude. They have to maneuver through very, very small spaces with a lot of information coming at them. So the, what's happening is our technology gets more sophisticated. There's more and more data, more and more information coming. So the captains of these giant seafaring machines, they have to have all the data they need, and it has to be very intuitive. This is just a quick example of the kind of simplicity. It doesn't matter how complicated your data is, how complicated your technology is. If you can't use it, um, it's not going to be value. So, valuable. So for us, we're looking a lot at something we like to call the simplicity premium. This idea that you pay more to get less, but you get less of, of, of the things you don't need and more of the things that you need. Get, out, get rid of the things that get in your way and focus on, the, on what's most critical. So this idea of speaking the language of machines and giving you simplicity means that we think people will pay more for just what they need. The second point I want to raise is this idea of uh, what we like to call the selfless machine. We think machines are, we're already seeing, they will be quite selfish and quite specific. They'll want to perform at a high level, and they will um, tell you when you need to help them. They'll help us change our outcomes by, by what they do. And here, here are a couple of real-life examples. A jet engine, we have an exhibit out there if you have a chance to look at it. But they're marvels of modern science. They really are. It's amazing. They can fly through incredibly diverse and harsh environments. Now, as new parts of the world become available, as, as transportation uh, you know, sort of zooms to new spaces around the world, Airlines and aircraft and aircraft engines are going through incredibly harsher and harsher environments. Think of pollution, think of dust, think of deserts and, uh, uh, and, and ice situations. So this this, these sort of harsh environments impact the performance. They impact the actual physical properties of the machine. We need to gather data to understand how we can perform better. So what will happen is just as every new generation of a computer chip has more and more computing power, each new generation of machine will come with more and more sensors and more and more computational power to monitor itself. And then it will instruct future generations so that they're better built, so they're more adaptable, so the right material properties are in place. We'll use it to model the impact in certain regions. So more pollution, you'll, you'll have to have a different composition. We'll redesign the services in those areas, and we'll change the material properties of future engines using new materials, new engineering that resist wear and tear. We like to call it design for environment. We'll change the physical properties and the ability predict to predict maintenance for any given route. 
this extends the life of the engines, and I'll give you a couple of examples. An average airline of, let's say, 100 777 uh, aircraft extends their engine life on the wing. If they can do that just 1% by adapting how they perform, that'll save about $100 million over the lifetime of the fleet. And for any of you who follow the aviation business, you know these are very low-margin low margin businesses. So we can deliver that outcome because we're able to fix the machine before it breaks. This idea of predictive maintenance is a very powerful force that we're all just uh, beginning to, to launch. So I told you that machines are going to be selfish. They're also going to be very selfless. Um, they are going to show quite generosity amongst themselves. A machine won't just say, hey, this is how I'm performing. A machine's going to say, hey, the machine next to me has something that needs replaced. Or based on cumulative behavior, the machine's going to say, here's what I did before, now here's what I need to do differently going forward. So they'll sense themselves, but they'll also sense the outside environment. Entire systems, whether we're talking about hospitals, air traffic control, rail lines, will function more together because of the sensing that's happening with machines in a network. So let me give you an example. Here's um, how we're going to create a valuable outcome by kind of the network of, uh, of machines. So if you look at a brilliant wind turbine farm or a brilliant wind turbine, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to do that, um, it doesn't just create its own energy. It adjusts to the way the wind is, the way the wind is blowing. Um, it points its direction to other turbines that are around. There's already software that's embedded in the wind turbines that analyzes tens of thousands of data points every second. Now, if you could start to adjust the energy output by just 5%, it translates up to 20% more turbine per wind farm of productivity. Now, let me give you an example and show you how that really works. So at the turbine level, a blade can change its pitch based on LIDAR and a lot of weather data that's, that's happening real time. You start to translate that on a wind farm level, one wind turbine signals to another about optimizing the performance between the two and create something like a wind symphony. At the entire wind farm level, they're able to send a signal to the utility saying, hey, we've really optimized our wind. We're much cheaper today. Use us versus gas or coal. That's something that we haven't been able to do to, until now by embedding sensors, software, and the ability to actually change the performance as, as you're moving. So network behavior, we think, becomes the norm. And the last thing I want to mention is just changing the way that we work. I've talked a lot about how machines will operate. They're also going to spur a revolution in how we make things and even what we do. So the lines between design and manufacturing, they're blurring in, in incredible ways. Some of it you're starting to see here. With 3D printing, printers, and easy-to-design software, um, the world of manufacturing and design have never been more accessible. And that has implications not only to the individual maker, but also for the largest engineering and manufacturing companies on Earth. Complexity will be free. Iteration will be rapid. Material waste will drop quickly. Uh, specialties start to uh, accelerate. Collaboration becomes the norm. To adjust to this uh, kind of new world, we've had to uh, adapt to uh, methodologies that are coming out of the software world. Lean Startup is something we've adopted in a very big way, applying it to our, 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 uh, applying it to our hardware efforts. We've also had to tap into the talents of the global brain, uh, where a host of opportunities are, are awaiting, where there's this buzzing hive of, hive of knowledge and connectivity, where there are people who are able to contribute ideas, to contrib contribute um, insights. And here's a quick example um, of a jet engine part that was designed by an engineer in Indonesia, not at GE, that takes 80% of the weight out of a part. By digitizing ourselves, access to challenges that we have on the industrial side, we're able to find ideas from anywhere in the world and to partner more and more with startups, with emerging companies, no matter where they are in the world. So to close, let me just say this quickly. Um, the reality is that there's a new process going on that we gather, we analyze, we adjust. 
It's changing manufacturing, it's changing how we perform, it's changing how we work. But what we're really excited about is the productivity wave that we think is coming to industry. If you were able to boost productivity by just 1% in industry, we think that there's about 10 to $15 trillion at stake. That's real money and real opportunity in industry. In healthcare alone, that's $65 billion of opportunity. So look, the needs are important. It's about getting uh, new capabilities to remote parts of the world, more efficiency to hospital, more efficiency to transportation. Um, and we think brilliant machines and the brilliant minds that work together are really, we're just at the beginning of what they're going to do to change the way we work and make, make incredible impact on our world. Thank you very much.